Hi, and welcome to Roswell United Methodist Church. My name is Michael Cromwell, and I have the joy of serving as one of the associate pastors here at RUMC. Thanks for joining us for our on-demand version of the sermon, which will be delivered later today. If you'd like to watch our services live, you can do so via our live stream at 9 o'clock and 11.15. Notice our different worship times and our different hours that we have now. You'll also be able to see the entire worship service service on demand later this afternoon at rumc.com slash sermons. We are so glad that you are with us today. We're thankful for your presence and we're thankful for your generosity and the different ways that you are helping to make RUMC a place of community and faith. Let's have a word of prayer before we hear our sermon. Gracious and loving God, we love you so much and we are grateful for this day and this day that we have to worship you. May the words that we are to hear, may they not only pierce our ears, but pierce our hearts as well, that we might be changed in different people because of what you have to say to us today. We thank you and we love you all in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Now let's hear our sermon from today. This morning I'll be reading from 2 Peter chapter 1, and I'll be reading verses 5 through 13, and this is what it says. Now for this very reason also, applying all diligence in your faith, supply moral excellence, and in your moral excellence, knowledge, and in your knowledge, self-control, and in your self-control, perseverance, and in your perseverance, godliness, and in your godliness, brotherly kindness, and in your brotherly kindness, Christian love. For if these qualities are yours and are increasing, they render you neither useless nor unfruitful in the true knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. For he who lacks these qualities is blind or short-sighted, having forgotten his purification from his former sins. Therefore, brethren, be all the more diligent to make certain about his calling and choosing you. For as long as you practice these things, you will never stumble. For in this way, the entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ will be abundantly supplied to you. Therefore, I shall always be ready to remind you of these things, even though you already know them, and having been established in the truth which is present with you. And I consider it right, as long as I'm in this earthly dwelling, to stir you up by way of reminder. Let's pray. Jesus, this day, breathe your Spirit on us that we might be stirred and respond. Thank you for your presence this day. May we never take it for granted. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. I read a story that during the Civil War, a young man was tried and convicted of treason. He was sentenced to be hanged. Well, he was a young man, and his mother appealed to Abraham Lincoln that he spare the life of her son with a presidential pardon. Well, Lincoln did pardon the young man, but he's reported to have said this, still I wish we could teach him a lesson. I wish we could give him a little bit of hanging. <laughs> well, what exactly is a little bit of hanging? Well, it's enough to give you a shake, a stir, to bring to mind the things that, that, that you already know that are right, the things that you already know. And that's exactly what Peter is doing right here. He's writing to a church that was persecuted, a church that had become discouraged, a church that needed encouragement. And so he starts off his letter to this church to, to tell them the things that they already know. To, in his words in verse four, four, 13, to stir them up. To stir them up, to wake them up, to shake them up. To remind them of the things that they already know. The basics. And what are the basics? Well, he reads them out right here starting in verse 5. He says that applying diligence in your faith. Diligence is as a practicing of faith. It's not diligence in diligence. It's diligence in your faith. 
Well, a lot of times we think of faith as, as something that's kept in our hearts or in our heads. And, and what, are you supposed to just think about faith more and more? Well, that's not what he's talking about. Not at all. He's talking about a relationship with Jesus Christ. And that word faith has the same root as the word believe. We just use it in different ways in English. And that root in Greek is pistis. And it means to lean on, to rely on, to trust in. It's, it's a practice. It's a practice. It's a diligent practice. It's something that we practice every minute of every day. To lean on, to rely on, to trust in Jesus. And that relationship that we have with Him. Paul was trying to let the church in Rome know this exact same thing. And he's writing to the church in Rome, a place that he's never been before. And in chapter 1, verse 16 and 17, he says, For I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. And then he goes ahead to say in verse 17, For in it, in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith, to faith. Well, it's not revealed from feeling to feeling. It's revealed from that relationship we have with, with Jesus, the leaning on Him, the relying on Him, the trusting in Him, to faith, to the leaning on, relying on, and the trusting in one another, from faith to faith. Lou Holtz tells a story about a fellow that was driving out in the country. He was enjoying the drive. He was joy enjoying the peacefulness. And his mind began to wander. And that's when he drove into a ditch. Well, he couldn't get his car out of the ditch. So he walked to a farmer's house, asked the farmer for help. The farmer said, I believe I can help you out. He said, I've got a, a mule named Daisy. She can pull your, your car out of the ditch. Well, he walked with the farmer to the barn to where Daisy was, and he saw the most run-down mule he'd ever seen. Well, the farmer hooked the reins up to Daisy and walked Daisy over to the car, hooked a rope to the car and to Daisy, and then slapped the reins and said, Come on, Daisy, come on, Jack, come on, Joe. And all of a sudden, Daisy came to life, perked right up, began to pull the car, and pulled his car all the way out of the ditch. Well, the man was so thankful, said, Thank you so much, I would have never thought Daisy would have the strength to pull my car out of the ditch. But why did you call Daisy and Jack and Joe? Well, that's when the farmer began to laugh. He said, if old Daisy thought she was the only one pulling, she wouldn't do a thing. Sometimes we get to thinking we're the only one pulling. Sometimes we think that we're all alone. And I think if, if there's anything marked by our current culture... It's a culture that tries to, to get us believe that we're isolated, that we're solitary, that we're alone. The righteousness of God, the character of God, the full power of God, the holiness of God, it's revealed from faith to faith, from leaning on Him, from trusting in Him, relying on Him, but leaning on, relying, and trusting in one another. That we're not alone. Yes, faith is personal, but it was never meant to be private. We hold up, we encourage, we strengthen, we build up one another. You may have received a letter about our Commons Project. That the Commons Project, right here in the center of our campus, is to draw people together in community and faith. A space set aside for community and the building up of faith of one another. Reaching out, yes, and, and small groups, Sunday school, but also in support groups, people that we don't even know, to reach out into the community, that we're outgrowing the, the space that we have to reach out to others. Some folks we don't even know. In Forty groups a week meet here at this church. Every week. Support groups, some of them are outgrowing their space. And this will provide space to encourage, to lift up, to build up. 
But it's also to lift up, to build up, to encourage some folks that maybe we haven't even met yet. Years from now, a space to reach out into the community, into the world, to let folks know they're not alone. Jesus is in front of us. He's behind us. He's within us. He's beside us. And it provides space where people, flesh and blood, will come alongside as well. The first thing that that Peter calls to you and to me is diligence, practice of faith. Not just keep it in your head, keep it in your heart, but to practice it with one another. But uh, you already knew that. I'm just here to remind you of what you already know. To remind you of what you already know. That's why Peter says he wrote, stir folks up, to wake them up, to shake them up, to remind them of what they already know. And that's the first thing, is that diligence in faith. But then in chapter 5, he also says moral excellence. Well, why in the world would he include moral excellence in that? That seems like the most obvious thing. Well, in some ways it might seem that way. But what was going on here in the early church was a heresy. They were following a lie, is what they were doing. That... They had this idea, if you're a Christian, if you had a relationship with Jesus Christ, you, really, you could keep on acting any old way you wanted to. You could keep saying anything that came to your mind and your feeling in your heart, as long as it, it didn't make any difference. That what you said, what you did, the way you acted, that if, if, if you were a Christian, it really didn't make any difference. Thomas Wheeler was the CEO of Massachusetts Mutual Life Insurance Company. He tells a story on himself that he and his wife were going on vacation. And they were kind of out in the middle of nowhere. He pulled over to get gas at a gas station. There was only one pump. It was, the station was dilapidated. One pump, one attendant gas station. And he began to put gas into his car. His wife said, would you like something to drink? She, while well, she went into the station. Well, he... He said yes, and she went into the station, and he could see through the window that she was getting very animated, and he looked at the, the attendant, and he was animated too, like they knew each other. And they talked for a while. She came back out. She gave him his drink, and they got back on the road. And then he, he turned to his wife and said, You know, I saw you through the window. You were very animated, and so was the attendant there, like you all knew each other. She said, Knew each other? She she said, I knew him very well. For two years we dated in high school. We almost got married. Well, Thomas Wheeler, he couldn't help but gloat a little bit. He said, well, I guess you're glad that you married me. CEO of Massachusetts Mutual Life Insurance Company. Because if you'd married him, you'd be tied to that dilapidated old one pump, one attendant gas station. She said, make no mistake, my dear. If I had married him, he would be CEO of Mass Mutual Life Insurance Company, and you'd be tied to a dilapidated one pump, one attendant gas station. <laughs> I think it's a great story. And it has a truth to it. And the truth is, relationships matter. That relationships matter. All of our relationships matter. They, they make a difference in the way that we act. The relationships, the people that we surround ourselves with, they make a difference in the way we speak. They make a difference in what we do. That relationships, well, they matter. And I do believe that the relationship with Jesus Christ is the most transforming relationship you or I will ever have. If it's practiced, practiced with a diligence. That the temptation in this culture is to act like culture, to speak like culture, to fit in with the culture. But God has much more for you and me than that. 
what he calls us is chosen, holy, and beloved. There's an intimacy that means we act with integrity. There's an intimacy that means we act with moral and integrity, with a moral excellence. Not that we're holier than thou, but what's holy in Jesus Christ makes its way all the way to our mouths, all the way to our hands. That it doesn't stay parked in our hearts or our heads, that it's practiced. That it's practiced. Well, I'm not telling you something you've never heard before or something that's brand new. No, I'm just, I'm reminding you of what you already know. Moral excellence. Diligence and faith. And there's a long list here, and don't worry, I'm not going to preach on every one of them in the long list. But I do want to mention one more. That, that... That Peter, to lift up, to build the church, calls for a diligence in faith and supply moral excellence and add to that knowledge, knowledge, self-control, and in self-control, perseverance, and in perseverance, godliness, and godliness, brotherly kindness. And he wraps it all up by saying, and in brotherly kindness, Christian love. It was Jesus who said, the way that they'll know you're my disciples is that you have love for one another. It was the last night of his earthly life that he said that. And then in John, John chapter 16, excuse me, 15, verse 17, he said, this I command you, that you love one another. It's not think about loving or, you know, if you feel like it, love each other or try to love. It was a command that Jesus gave to his disciples, to you and to me. And it's the Apostle Paul in Galatians 6, too, that says, Bear with one another's burdens and fulfill the law of Christ. That law of, of love. That's what Peter uses to wrap around all of these reminders. The belt of love. That it's that belt of love that ties us together in unity. And, and Jesus, on the last night of his earthly life, in his his, his final prayer four times prayed for our unity, that we be tied together with the bands of love, with the strength of love. Howard Kelly tells a story. It's a story about when he was a young boy. By any measure, Howard Kelly would have been considered poor. He said that every once in a while, when he didn't have anything to eat, he would have to find things to go door to door in a small town to try and sell. Sometimes it'd be a magazine or a newspaper, anything he could get his hands on. And this particular day was one of those days. He was a young boy and he was knocking on doors to, he doesn't remember what he was selling, but he, he wasn't having any luck. He said he'd missed breakfast, he'd missed lunch, and the heat of the day was bearing down on him. And he told himself at the next house, he was going to ask whoever answered the door for something to eat. But when the woman answered the door, she was so pretty, he forgot all about what he was going to say. So he just blurted out, may I have a glass of water? Well, she could see that he was weary and that he was beginning to falter, and so Instead of bringing him a glass of water, she brought him four large cookies and a glass of milk. And Howard Kelly says that when she did that, that his faith in God was renewed by that simple act of kindness. That his faith in God was renewed by the simple act of kindness. Fast forward many years later. The woman who had given Howard Kelly the four cookies and large glass of milk grew very sick. And the doctor in that small town 
told her that he couldn't help her, but there was a specialist in a distant city that could. She referred the woman to the specialist in the distant city. That specialist was Dr. Howard Kelly. He didn't remember the, the woman's name, but he did know the doctor that referred her. And when he walked into the room to meet the woman, that's when Dr. Kelly recognized her. Well, he didn't say anything at that time that what he did do was attend to the sick woman day and night, and he saved the life of the woman. When she got when she grew well and got ready to, to leave the hospital, she received the bill. And at the bottom of the bill was a handwritten note. It said, your bill was paid in full a long time ago with four large cookies and a glass of milk. I was that young boy. You showed kindness. Signed, Dr. Howard Kelly. It's the everyday things. It's the common things. It's the act of kindness. It's what we do. It's what we say. That the love of Jesus Christ is made real. That he not only transforms us, but he connects us with all around us in the simple act, in the everyday act. But I'm not telling you something that you don't already know. I just came to stir you up. To shake you up. To, to wake you up. To point to Jesus Christ. The one who has power we don't. Power for diligent faith. Power for moral excellence. And a power for Christian love. This morning it may be that you're in that place. That place where you feel distant. That place where you feel lost and forgotten. Sitting alone will not change the feeling. Jesus Christ can. Reach out. Because the chances are good that it's in the reaching out. That, that it's the righteousness of God, the character of God, the holiness of God will be revealed from faith to faith. That it's in the reaching out. That it's in the act. That it's in the word. The everyday kindness. That you'll begin to know his strength. He rose from the grave that his strength, his power, his spirit might live in you. And it may be that you've never invited the spirit of the risen Christ to live in you. And I want to pray with you now. Let's pray. Jesus, that relationship with you, well, we call it faith. And too often we, we expect faith to be something that just stays dormant as a, as a thought or an idea or a feeling. But Jesus, this day, with the power of your Spirit, will you enter into us and begin to transform us? What we say, what we think, what we do, that it might reflect your Spirit on the inside of us and in and, and, and the everyday, the ordinary ways, we might be strengthened, encouraged, and reach out beyond ourselves. We need your strength. Sometimes we fool ourselves thinking that we don't. Strength that won't just reach out and do what we want, but instead what you want. We need that strength. We need your encouragement. We need the power of your spirit. Breathe it on us now. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Thanks again for joining us today. 
Um, just a reminder, if you'd like to watch the entire worship service, you can do so via live stream at 9 o'clock and 11.15 a.m. You can also view the service on demand a little bit later this afternoon at rumc.com slash sermons. Also, if you have any prayer requests, we would love to hear about those. You can send those in to pray at rumc.com. Also, if you'd like to give of your tithes and your offerings, you can do that online as well. And that's at rumc.com slash giving. Uh, thanks again for joining us today and for honoring God with your presence. We hope and pray that you have a wonderful week and we look forward to seeing you again next week. Hi. Thank you for joining us. My name is Tom Davis. I'm senior pastor here at Roswell United Methodist Church. Our mission here at RUMC is to help people live a Christ-centered life. We're a welcoming church, we're a biblical church, and we're a compassionate church. That the, we believe that the way that, that God made us, that He made us in His image, and what the Bible tells us is that His image is an us, is an our, when God said in the creation story, let us create humans in our image, He made us to be in community together. He made us to connect to Him and one another. That's the place that this is at Roswell United Methodist Church, a place of community and faith. I want to invite you to join us. It might be online, it might be through social media, or it might be here in person. We meet at 9 o'clock in a contemporary service with a band. We also have two 1115 services. One is here in the sanctuary with a traditional choir and organ. We also meet at 1115 with a band in our chapel. Thank you for joining us, and I look forward to meeting you.